Well, welcome everyone. Uh, hello, I I'm Jimmy Carr. You, uh, nice to be here. Um, and you, you can now um, sit ringside as, as I flirt with Kent Altman for 40 minutes trying to get work in America. <laughs> It's going to be a lot of fun, I think, uh, and then we're going to open it to questions at the end. You need no introduction, you are a big deal in comedy, but we've made an introduction, so we're going to show it. We have a special show today. You're more than welcome to join. Yeah! Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy! Woo! Yeah, get it! Yes! <laughs> Cheers! Ah! Who's next? Who's next? Oh my God. <laughs> Well, we are just two sangle gals doing our thing. Oh my God! Lana! Lana! Do the children not have names? Oh, I don't think of them in terms of names. I think of them in terms of love. These are the ones that I love. One day, I'll be sitting on this bed with an even younger boy. This is where stars are born. This is where it happens. Whoa, whoa bitch. Let's roll. This is like the Olympics for assholes. Alex Hooper is why you don't feed Richard Simmons after midnight. Yeah. So if this relationship ends, you'll find someone pretty quick. Sure. OK. Well, you guys seem great. I'm taking this chair away from another American white guy. Welcome to Sienica, Slovenia. Hometown of Melania Trump. How did you come up with the idea of Melania's soap? Was it because she was a particularly dirty girl? I have become the master of two worlds, America and Earth. What are we, off-roading? <laughs> what's been going on while I've been gone? I'll tell you what's been going on. We've been stuck with a Putin-loving, perma-golfing, bronze-encrusted con man in chief, and you're back with jokes? Welcome to the Donald J. Trump Presidential Twitter Library. My favorite tweet was Kafefe. Kafefe. The Trumpster is our president, from apprentice to president. I love, tr I love Trump. It's incredible, right? <laughs> Makes you want to blow your brains out. It's, it's so mind-boggling. Well, hello there, children. I need you to tell me the worst thing I can say to piss off black people. Beyonce ain't nothing but a Taylor Swift ripper. That helps, thank you. What? If you're white and you want to dress as someone black, let the skin part of the costume be imagination. The skin color is not going to make you look like Samuel L. Jackson. Yelling motherfucker and putting some snakes on some goddamn planes will. Oh. <laughs> Cover up your hog! I can't, my hands aren't big enough. <laughs> That's good. You're my best friend. You're my best friend. Welcome to America. You overshot it. Back up, back, 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 back. We're here to talk to you about your shirt. Mm, I'm not wearing a shirt. Exactly, that's the problem. Today's casual Friday. Right, but it's distracting to the other employees. Because they can see your nipples. Are you saying there's something wrong with my nipples? Welcome to the series finale of the White House Correspondents' Dinner. This is just season one of a four-year reality show. <laughs> I appreciate you. <laughs> Sorry, I gotta put my phone on vibrate. You okay? Uh oh, Quest loves. Quest love? Oh, Thanks to me. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> my girl and I got together based on our love for drunk history. <laughs> this is awesome! Um, why wouldn't you? We're, um. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great show reel. I mean, I, I read a thing that you said when you when you took the job in Comedy Central that you you came back there and it was uh, the network was the Daily Show, the Colbert Report, South Park, and the Ghost of Dave Chappelle. Did I say that? You did say that. Yeah, it was very witty. That seems well kind of rude. I think it was all right. Okay. But I mean, you've got a lot of great sort of TV on there now. Tell me, how did you get your start in in the world of comedy? Uh, I started by being a smart ass kid uh, when I was growing up. And, uh, but I never thought of myself as a comedian. I just always appreciated comedy. And uh, my parents had a lot of comedy records. You know, Bill Cosby, Bob Newhart, all the you know, great American role models. I think, yeah. Well, Bob Newhart, certainly. 50%, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't want to have to tell him. Yeah, uh, I heard heart. about it. I heard, yeah. Uh, <laughs> And um, so I always loved comedy, but I never thought of myself as someone who could work in it. I, I grew up in Texas, and I thought, oh, other people do that. 
And then uh, I studied uh, photography and graphic design in college, moved to New York, worked in the graphic design business. But I always had this, this interest and sort of itch about entertainment and comedy. And um, so I worked for a design firm that did a lot of marketing and graphic design work in the entertainment industry. And I sort of came in through that direction, made contacts. and and then pulled the plug on it and got together with writer friends and started pitching ideas to the contacts that I'd made, people who have these kinds of jobs. And uh, I kind of scratched around doing some freelance work here and there. I did one project for Comedy Central during an election when they were first starting their political coverage. It was the even, uh, it was the very beginning, prior to The Daily Show even, they were doing indecision coverage, they called it. Al Franken and wow. uh, Billy Kimball was a producer. Anyway, and then, um, my real break was I conned my way into a job with Michael Moore, who had a show so called TV, TV Nation. Nation yeah. Right. And it was on here in the UK on BBC yeah. Two and on NBC and Fox in uh, the States. So conned your way in. There'll be people in the room interested in how that happened. Well, I think a theme of, uh, of today will be about uh, two, I guess, two parts. One is that I never really had a plan. And the other is that I've uh, managed to get several jobs I had no business getting. Good, you're, you're an excellent story for us. Yeah, um, same here. Hopefully um, it'll be inspirational for... So, I mean, on a personal note, now working in, in comedy, working sort of the head of Comedy Central and started leadership, strategy and management, do you still watch comedy for fun or is it all work now? Oh no, I still, I'm first and foremost a fan of comedy. Right, and what, what's, the, what's the show that slipped through your fingers? What's the thing that you wish was on Comedy Central right now? Um, let's see. I, um, well, there's always shows that are out there. That, um, uh, Aziz Ansari has a show on Netflix called Master of None. I really love uh, all the shows Louis C.K. is involved with. Um, there's a show on HBO called uh, Silicon Valley that I think is not only really funny and great, but it works with a lot of the, the talent and comedians who are sort of in our family. and. Uh, so that one feels like yeah, because you did the meltdown with Kumail and you know yeah, we worked with Kumail and TJ yeah. and yeah, it's great. Um, so what I mean, you've had, had kind of a very successful career at Comedy Central in America. What's Incredibly, the, yeah, it's yeah. gone. <laughs> it's gone bloody well. Uh, the thing, the thing. No, you know, I just want to say I couldn't figure out why they called this the Game Changers, and then I came into the room and I realized that I've single-handedly had the like the least filled room for a Jimmy Carr show in probably <laughs> over a decade, right? That's good. So in that regard, I am a game changer. <laughs> but I, so I, I want to both apologize to you for that. And also, thank you for doing this, by the way. How, how great is it that Jimmy Carr, this is like, for how me, it's like, I? I'm just, yeah, right? I mean, well, let's, I'm very honored that you let's, would do this. Let's manage our expectation. Nothing funny may happen. Um, We'll see. So, uh, in terms of like the, the interesting thing for me is commissioning TV shows must be the most fun thing. You find talent, you find great people, and you go, right, let's put the show on, and you have the power to do that. The, the flip side of it, I'm quite interested in the tough choices when you have to cancel a TV show, and when you have to say, how long do you give a show before you say that's, I'm, I'm well, going to pull the plug? It, it's funny, when you first started that question, I was thinking, you said the uh, commissioning shows must be so fun, and mm -hmm. yet the other 90% of my job even before anything gets on the air, is saying no to people. Uh, so that's the hardest part, I think, is saying no. Especially to Bill Cosby. Yeah. <laughs> he will not stop asking either, right? I've tried everything. I tried being passive aggressive, like just not answering. I've tried being direct with him. I mean, he just Nothing. doesn't know how to take no for an answer. <laughs> just drink that, you'll be fine. Um, <laughs> But in terms of that process, but, so, I mean, only sort of 10% of your job, the really fun bit is saying, finding something like, I mean, my favorite thing at the moment, you know, something like Broad City and saying, right, they've got such a particular voice and I'm going to give them this, this opportunity. Yeah. And then when it hits, it's just fantastic. Well, there's, uh, there's, I think there's different aspects to that question. It is really hard, uh, especially if it's a show you really believe in and you love and it's just not happening and it's a really tough call to say say it's it's done with its run um, a good exa a recent example of that is a show called review with Andy Daly uh, yeah. I, in my opinion that's as good of a comedy show that exists and yet yeah, it he's didn't an connect. incredible performer yes. yeah he's so talented and and so we did you know we did several seasons I think that when I took the job, one of the, 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 Doug Herzog is the person who, who brought me in, 
and I talked to him in advance, uh, kind of going back to where you started about what Comedy Central was at that time. Um, I felt like that there were issues that were that transcended just about development and talent and what bets to make. But also, one of the things was that I think they were they had fallen into a trap of trying to find lightning in a bottle in the sort of in the vapors of Dave Chappelle. And there, there, were, there was a little bit of a tradition of doing sort of one and done series. Like they would do a series, a, a season, and if it didn't work, th next. And they kept, kept going through things. And I really felt like that we had to change the way we were working and the, the, the shows that we really believed in to really invest in them, especially in this day and age. It can take so long for something to really connect and catch on and start to get some currency. Well, I think The Daily Show is a really good example of that because I mean, it's what people think of it as being, of course, it was always there and always a big hit, but before Jon Stewart was there, it was not a big show. It wasn't, it wasn't huge. And then he made it into this thing. And I mean, I'm very interested in that thing. I mean, I'm, I'm a, a friend of Trevor Noah's and we've known each other a long time. And when he got that job, mm -hmm. that was a very interesting thing looking in mm -hmm. because it was, a, it was, I knew how great he was but it was very clear from the press coverage, you know, America didn't yet. Right. I think you were proved right, but that's an interesting, how did you make that decision? Well, uh, from the, in terms of the premise, we, I really thought that uh, to try to replace Jon Stewart was a fool's errand. And if that's what we were directly trying to do, we would fail. I felt like Jon Stewart sort of walked away after 16 plus years as the undefeated heavyweight champ of late night. And I mean, without peer. And if our mission was to find a younger version of John, we would just fail at the outset. It would be impossible. And also, John was really had had he turned, as you suggested, the show that he inherited from Craig Ferg, uh, Craig Kilborn was much different. John made it much more political, and and John really uh, focused on. Uh, sort of, he set his, his target on politics in general and media coverage, but very specifically on the 24-hour cable news networks like Fox News. And, you know, at the time that John walked away, it was a new era was really upon us. And, you know, when John started in all those years, there was no social media, for example. And he wasn't that interested in it, which you could understand. And, and so when we, when we realized that we finally had that unenviable task of replacing John, we thought, okay, let's look at it as an opportunity to bring someone in who would really sort of pivot the show and take it in a new direction. So we were very thorough in the search and we entertained every possibility. Uh, and Trevor just seemed to emerge as the one. We didn't hire him for his, his experience. We hired him for his talent and his brain and his good sense. Uh, and what you're referencing when it was met with resistance uh, at the beginning, when we first made the announcement, people thought, oh, what a bold, fresh idea. And it got really positive coverage. And then people started uncovering his Twitter history and found jokes that they didn't find to their liking. And then the whole narrative shifted. And uh, everyone thought, this guy doesn't, especially fans of Jon Stewart, were so resistant. And very traditional media in the States were very anti-Trevor. Well, I'm, I'm very, I'm interested in that because I know Trevor well enough to know what his story was and how mm -hmm. he came in there and how he's dealt with that from sort of the talent point of view. But from your point of mm -hmm. view, being in charge of the network and standing by someone mm -hmm. and knowing, having the confidence to say, well, I've made the right decision here, or, I, or maybe you just say, well, I'm not, I don't change my mind once it, my decision is made. How long would you have given that? Because it really feels like through the Trump campaign through, mm -hmm. it's really found its voice. Yeah, I think that when, when that narrative shifted, it did two things. One, the negative side was that it just created a whole narrative that didn't, we didn't anticipate to happen. And it created these headwinds that we had to fight through, right? There was just so much resistance. And, and also, you know, I, every time I would be interviewed in the press, I would tell whoever I was talking to, it's fair to compare Trevor to John as long as you compare the beginning of Trevor to the beginning of John. But to compare the beginning of Trevor, who had never done a show like this, to the end of someone who did it for 16 plus years is foolish and not fair. Uh, that didn't seem to matter. But the other thing, uh, so we also live in a world now where people love to rush to judgment about something before it even exists. So really, Trevor was judged before he even launched the show. There was months and months and months where he was adversely judged as being terrible for this, and he'd never done it. So I also found that a little bit comical. 
and the positive side of that was that I knew, I know who Trevor is, and I knew that the way he was being portrayed in the media and what his sensibility was and that he was this like awful racist, you know, frat boy humor and all that, I knew that wasn't him, so I thought, oh, this actually lowers the bar in a way that could actually help us in the long run when people start to really discover, when they open up and see who he really is, he will be judged favorably. So I never had doubts that he would prevail. Um, and then also I knew, and when I say I, I mean all of us, you know. Uh, I'm here with two colleagues at the festival, uh, Sarah Babineau, who's head of, uh, co-head of uh, talent and development in New York, and Jonas Larson in Los Angeles. And, you know, we had a lot of resolve with each other, that there was never a moment of doubt that he was the right choice. And we knew that it would take him a while to find his voice, and it did, but we knew that he would get there. And, and I think part of it was also that uh, it, was, it was sort of that, A, Trevor had never had a job like that. It would take him a while on camera to get comfortable and to find his point of view. And, but also that it would take a while for him to wrap his arms around the production machine. It's an enormous undertaking to put a show like that together, you know, four days a week. And, I mean, and in a sense, you know, Trevor was tried and tested in that he'd had a TV career in South Africa. He was, a very, he was doing very, very well internationally. He was really making inroads here, I think, and doing brilliantly mm -hmm. in stand-up. Uh, I'm very interested in Broad City as well as my other sort of favorite show on your network. And the idea that some, you know, Broad City were making shorts on mm -hmm. the internet. Mm -hmm. And the idea that it seems that there's, you know, we talk about this being the game changing. I think the game has changed a little bit with social media and the way that people consume content and the short form media. And it seems that they've taken quite a lot from Comedy Central. They take little clips and people want to watch them for free on their phones. Mm -hmm. But also something like Broad City really pays back because you take those short clips and you go, actually, they need a bigger canvas. Mm -hmm. and you, how did you find that? Uh, well, we, you know, they came from the UCB world, so we were familiar with them, and I think they had done a couple of seasons of web shorts, um, and they they came and pitched, you know, uh, around town with Amy Poehler had uh, they had sent an, uh, a query out to her if she would be a guest star in one, and she surprised them by saying yes, and then she talked to them about, you know, sort of mentoring them and becoming executive producer. So Amy and, and uh, Abby and Alana came and pitched the show around town and we were excited by it. And for me, it's not just a matter of how well it does on, uh, as, as a, as a uh, web series, you know, on the digital platform. I mean, we get so many pitches that come in and they tell us, you know, this has X million views and it's a surefire thing. And we, we, we never are swayed that way, you know, otherwise right. we would have done shows with, you know, talking oranges and uh, cats that bat Play the piano, yarn yeah, around and things like they that. They are huge. Yeah, they are huge. That's the future. Uh, but for us, we meet with someone like, uh, with, with people like Abby and Alana, we knew they were funny because of the web shorts, but, you know, when you get to know them, what you really start to find out is, uh, what are their what are their brains like as producers, and, mm. and what's their work ethic like, and what's their vision, and their you know, and that's really this what matters to suggest whether a series has longe but the potential for longevity. Well, the other thing about longevity as well is in the in the way that the industry works now, someone like uh, it feels to me like you gave Amy Schumer her break. I, I mean that sketch show was I thought unbelievably. Uh, in incredible hit rate for a sketch show, mm -hmm. just hit after hit sketch. Obviously, a lot of that sort of went online, and you know she's really kind of blown up mm -hmm. since Trainwreck. But it felt like you were there first. So, in terms of Abby and Alana and Broad City, how do you keep hold of that talent? How do you keep them on Comedy Central? I know there's a there's a deal with you know the other Viacom companies to maybe do films. Mm -hmm. Is that the plan? Is that the yeah? There's well, I think each one of those is a slightly different case. Uh, so in the case of Amy or like Key and Peele, um, you know, we gave them a platform for their, uh, for them to do short form sketch to really say what they had to say. And I think that there is a, a little bit of a limit on sketch shows, unless it's like an SNL where, you know, it's a revolving cast through the years, but there's an institution. The ones that are really creator driven, written, performed, produced by, I think that there's a limit to how long they can go. And in our attitude is as long as you have something to say, uh, we right. continue. Well, let, I mean, we should probably just pause and, and sort of, you know, think of our audience here. Um, there's people in the room that make television. Uh, they probably want to make television for... They may even be asleep right now. Yeah. 
well, let's not disturb them. But I was going to ask, <laughs> I was going to ask the, you know, what's the DNA of a Comedy Central show? I sort of see that there's, there are some themes that come through mm -hmm. when I look at things like uh, Key and Peele, Inside Amy Schumer and Broad City. It, there's progressive political ideas, not, not shoved down people's throats, but there seems to be, there's a, uh, and The Daily Show as well, obviously. Mm -hmm. It feels like it's very progressive politically. Do you have an idea of what, what a, what, what a Comedy Central show looks like? Yeah, I, we, we're very um, genre agnostic for me. It's all about uh, what's the point of view of the talent, what's their vision, and then we work with them to help them try to find what's the purest, most unfiltered vehicle for them to express their comedic well, let me, point Let me of ask view. it the, the, the reverse kind of way. What I'll do try you get, to not answer it well. What again. do you get pitched the whole time? What's the thing that you just, oh, this again? Uh, well, right now it's uh, it's shows about Trump. There's just you know since the election we just got an onslaught of everything from animated to fake reality to scripted. You yeah. know, but I mean that. But Fox News are doing such a great job. Well, he's doing such a good job himself. Yeah. It's it's I don't know. It's a hat on a hat. Yeah. Making jokes about Trump. I mean, he's when Donald Trump took to office, little did he know. Yeah. Or not? Maybe he did. Um, but we, you know, we did greenlight one series called The President Show, yeah. which is very directly not only about Trump, it stars... Oh, I, I watched that and I didn't get that. You didn't get it? No, the, the one with just Trump in it all the way through? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's an incredible impression. Have you seen it? Yeah. yeah. So Anthony Antamanac does a, an amazing I Trump... Did, I did a show, with, I did At Midnight with him and he was... Oh, right. It was pre-election and he does this incredible Trump. I mean, it's... It's unbelievable, but obviously he's, well not obviously, but he's a very liberal thinker. So he was really hoping that the election would go the other way, but also could see his career was gonna blow up. Yeah, it was he's very terrible. conflicted. Yeah, he's really yeah. conflicted. He's, yeah. he's buying a big house going, well, America's ruined. But, but I told great. him, you know, I told him that if God forbid Trump gets impeached or taken out of office for some reason, we, I will happily do uh, Trump in exile. So he'll, he can continue. <laughs> so I want him to be able to <laughs> for what he, want, follow his heart. Okay, what, what voice is currently missing in the comedy landscape? I, I see a lot of different voices on Comedy Central, and lot, you know, a lot of people are represented by shows on Comedy Central. What, what's, what's missing at the moment? What, what are you? I feel like I for? should have a show on Comedy Central, and it just hasn't happened for me. So that I think that's missing. No, um, you mean what type of show? Or? Yeah. Is there anything that you feel like oh, I really want? A, I really want something that even that appeals to uh, this demographic, or that appeals to because people that want to you know pitch TV shows will, will want some guidance on. Well, I would say that uh, one of the things that has been very difficult for us is to find animated shows that can live in the shadow of South Park. You know, South Park sets such a high standard. Uh, you know, that to me, that show is almost like the, the ultimate expression of a great comedy show. It's funny, it's accessible, but it's acerbic and has fantastic social and uh, political and cultural satire. And, uh, but it's really just a simple little show about these, you know, uh, uh, primary school. I'm trying to use the vernacular here. Yeah, it, uh, it does know, seem incredible that, I mean, the standard that they've managed to keep 21 up. 21 years it's yeah. starting. It's, it's and, they, and they somehow haven't been swayed by, even though they went off and made an incredible movie with Paramount and did brilliantly. I think we're getting applause. Yeah. Did you hear yeah. that? Yeah. I, 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 that's always going on in my head. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Like, <laughs> how I Deservedly so. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. So, so for someone like, like South, South Park, it's quite interesting because we are you know, talking before the, the interview about you know, when comedy goes too far and how do you stand by people. South Park has had its controversies over yep. the years, mm -hmm. but they always felt to me, when I've done stuff with Comedy Central in America and gone through it with the lawyers, they feel untouchable. It feels like South Park can do anything they want and you have their back. Well, yeah, I mean, we're not in the business of censoring people. We're in the business of empowering people. And uh, personally, I feel like you know, I, I, I feel like comedy, as much as it's funny and fun and can be frivolous, it serves a really important uh, role in society. And I feel like it always has, you know. It, I mean, here we are in the realm of uh, history and monarchy. The court jester was the only one who had permission to speak truth to the king, right? There, there, there is a reason, I think, that, and I think good comedy always reflects society and helps process 
society, and again, it can be political, cultural, social, whatever. And so that part I really take seriously, and I think that it's healthy for society to have strong, good comedy. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great thing to have you, you know, adhere to as the head of Comedy Central. I think it's very difficult for people here that are commissioners in the UK, because sometimes it's, you know, it's the individual's job on the line to mm -hmm. go, well, we better cut that joke because we're going to get complaints, and we know, and, and often I feel it's the tail wagging the dog. We have uh, a, a press in the UK that sometimes just goes after a joke, and they know full well it's a joke, but they decide we're going to make this into a big story and try and try and get. No, some it's to very. It's gotten very complicated everywhere. I mean, even in the states. I mean, well, well, the Kathy know. Griffin case is very interesting, where mm -hmm. uh, a, 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 you know a great comedian has to uh, effectively resign or has her career curtailed, mm -hmm. and the president doesn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know, on the other hand, he's just trying to make America great again. So you know. Yeah. Why, God, so, I hadn't why, thought why of that. Shitty. Um, <laughs> no, I think, I, I think we live in a world now where what I, I even referenced it before about that there's so much, uh, pe people have ad agendas now. So even in what used to be a free press and, you know, we're, we're, we just are hanging on by thin threads about journalism in general. Everything seems to be agenda driven. People prejudge stuff, people take stuff out of context so that it fits their agenda. And with, the, with social media and the internet, things can be explosively take a life on of their own and almost become truth and reality. And that's a lot of what we're dealing with in our culture now anyway, trying to sort all that out. And I think that when, when you think about how social media has affected, it's helped comedy, but it's also, I think, compromised comedy in some ways. You know, in this, you know a com I don't have to tell you this, a comedy club is a great place for a comedian to work out material, that is a workshop, right? And with social media and everyone having a phone and putting stuff out there and someone might tell a joke that offended someone and then it gets fed into the agenda machine and it can really hurt a career and it's a shame to me because it's really taking the craft of, of comedy away from the craftsperson and really tying their hands in a way. So if you think about, you know, what used to be free reign for people to test their material out with actual humans, and isn't that how you find out when things yeah, are I mean, working the, the, or not? It's the old line, the audience is a genius. You don't know right. what's funny or not. It's the only comedian. truthful thing, right, is the audience, that yeah. things work or they don't work in an unfiltered way. And you introduce, you know, uh, smartphones and the internet, and the stakes are much different. It's also different. the fact that the content kind of gets eaten up by the internet. The idea that, I mean, I don't know whether you view it as a help or a hindrance, the idea that, you know, clips go viral from your shows. Mm -hmm. And do you care that people aren't watching it necessarily? They might watch a, a piece of The Daily mm -hmm. Show, but they're not necessarily tuning into the whole it's thing. A, it's a really tricky balance. Because it's how both. do you, you can't monetize that. Exactly. But, and it's then a, you have to pay for the shows, though. Yeah, it's a very difficult era we're living in. There's this disconnect between popularity on the one hand and measurement and monetization on the other. And until it gets sorted out, it's you're trying to feed two beasts that are directly contradictory to well, each I mean, other. I don't want to give you a hard time, but that is your job. You have to oh, figure shit. this out. I just have to make jokes. It turns out I've made a great decision. Um, should we open up to some questions from, from the floor? Does anyone have any questions? I mean... Literally none. Yes, he has a question. Hello. Hello. Uh, just picking up on that point you made. Um, you know, that, that makes up. Thank you. Oh, yeah, just, just uh, in case uh, you want to beatbox. <laughs> 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 I'm not going to. Um, uh, yeah, that, that is a really difficult problem. And, you know, do you have, I'm not asking you to solve that problem, but do you have ideas about how that monetization, that, I suppose, fairness, could work for Comedy Central. How would how would you go about approaching approaching that? Do you think? Well, it's uh, it's an ongoing discussion that we have, and there's people that are at higher levels and are smarter than I am who are really the ones charged with figuring that out. And I'm really waiting for them to figure it out. It's the um, Illuminati. Yeah, uh, but it you know look on the one hand. It's good marketing for a show like The Daily Show. If, if things go viral, it gives the show more exposure. We also have our own owned and operated platforms that are monetized. It's just that in this, it, up till this point, it's, it's, it kind of pales in comparison to the linear channel. 
So I think the, all of this is changing, uh, but how it all settles out, we don't, we don't really know yet. And I, I certainly don't. But do you think there's a responsibility um, from publishers like Facebook and YouTube? You know, that's, that's been a running theme in this conference this week. Uh, do you think they have a responsibility that they're not currently fulfilling um, with, with content like yours? I'm not sure what you mean, what responsibility? I suppose in terms of, you know, clips that maybe go up that people are viewing over the official Comedy Central clips and things like well, that. Well, when if, if clips from Comedy Central or any Viacom brand is up on YouTube and it's there illegally, it's asked to be taken down and it gets taken down. We, we have official channels on YouTube as well. So we try to use it in the ways that are um, productive and above well, board. I but. suppose that comes on again to, you know, the idea of you make a show, I mean a lot of the shows you make, I presume, just for America. That's the biggest market for Comedy Central. Mm -hmm. But then there's Comedy Centrals all around the world. I do mm -hmm. a lot of stuff with Comedy Central UK who are here today. Um, how, how does that work in terms of when you make a show in America, do you think of, well actually this is going to work great because Scandinavia will love this? Or are you ever thinking of that? Uh, we, we think, yeah, Finland in particular. Um, no, we... Um, Someone from Finland. The Finnish. Welcome. Let's hear it for the Finnish. Um, no, it's not one, no. Now I'm worried that they thought I meant it's the end of this. Yeah. Um, let's hear it for the beginning and middle also. Yeah. Um, well, we... Look, uh, that's one of the new charges. So we have a new CEO at Viacom. He uh, has, you know, put a strategy out there uh, that's like five or six point strategy. Part of it is to have, instead of so many brands all ubiquitously there tied together, which is kind of an old model, is to really have six flagship brands. And one, so some of the attributes are that they should be global. So. Uh, some brands like Nickelodeon have been very uh, been working on that for years. We're in the process, like uh, I mentioned, Jonas and and Sarah. Uh, the three of us, along with two of our other colleagues, just spent two days in London with Louise and Brad, and I'm not sure who else is here. They're the ones I saw here so far, uh, with our colleagues in in London uh, to like to start paving the way to create a foundation where we can integrate more. Because there's been some notable successes, things like Drunk History, mm -hmm. which when I first saw it in the States, I kind of thought, oh, it's a very American thing, and then it's worked very well here. I mean, that's Well, it another... turns out that every country in the world does have history, and they all like to get drunk. <laughs> and so, yeah, I think it's in five territories now. Good luck in Saudi Arabia, is all I'm going to say. <laughs> Good luck with that. All well, the best. it's true. You know, it's funny. I think that one of the challenges of being a global comedy brand is that, you know, there there is a, a balancing act. I think with what the, so much really great comedy is very rooted in whatever region it's created. I mean, that's why it resonates there, and it doesn't necessarily translate. Uh, and then there's also other issues like w as much as we talk about how we are in the business of trying to give an unfiltered platform for creative voices, uh, there's other countries like Saudi Arabia where you cannot do that. You know, that there's political and censorship issues in different countries that really affect comedy and really affect how, uh, how global, you know, any particular show or talent can, can be. So it is a delicate balance. Yeah. Okay, any other, what other questions do we have? Oh, he's got, hello, how are you? You can just speak loudly, I'm sure. It's quite a small room. Uh, are you interested in buying formats? Hang on, someone's got a format to sell. Yeah. Are you Am interested, I interested in, buying in buying formats? From elsewhere, or do you just generate your own material? Uh, we're, we're both. We're anything, especially if it's a format that would work in, in the States and could have international appeal, bring it on. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's an interesting thing, though, that the, the, the UK formats that have been incredibly successful here, there's sort of two things going on at the same time. There's panel shows don't mm -hmm. really work in America, haven't mm -hmm. really been tested in America. No one's done sort of successful panel shows there. I get it. <laughs> could be a question, could be interesting. Uh, but, but equally, we can't get late night right. We, yeah. we, we've not, we're not able to do that. Our, it, it just doesn't work in Why our Why do you think that is? Um, I'm not entirely sure. I don't think we have the, the volume of late night is partly the, the issue. It's the critical But it has worked in the past, right? Like the 11 o'clock show? 
Uh, was was never at the time. Was that successful? I mean, great it was, talent it, came. It through broke there. lots of talent and mm -hmm. did very well. I don't think it ever did well for the people making it, but mm. afterwards it was it was huge. It gave us Ali G and Ricky Gervais, and loads of people kind of came through that. Maybe you should, maybe you guys should put someone like Donald Trump in charge, and all of a sudden late night would really do well. <laughs> Well, it feels to me like the, the Daily Show has never been more relevant to us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, once Donald Trump, once, once he started running for office, that show became our news. It wasn't just America's news. Mm -hmm. It felt like Obama was your president and Trump is, it's everyone's problem. Yeah. Well, there are global implications for sure. And I think going back to Trevor, that was something that was really interesting when he started having traction. I think a lot of it was that he had a view of Trump that was very different than every other single late night. Well, host. because he's comparing him to Zuma. Exactly so right. So he's going. This guy's not that crazy. The first piece that Trevor did that really felt like uh, A was fantastic, but B no one else could have done was he was comparing Trump to an African uh, dictator, uh, and it was so brilliantly done. It could have only been observed by him, you know, not by the rest of the late well, night. It is odd, crowd. isn't it? The more the more unique the voice, the more sort of you know universal it yeah. can become. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Other questions? Okay, everybody, take a breath. I, everyone's fighting to ask questions. I think we need to <laughs> well, restore order. Let's, in here. let's go with this this lady. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Um, Hi. What do you think the main differences are between comedy in the U.S. Oh, com Cutness, all right. Uh, comedy in the U.S. and comedy in the U.K. Like, what do you like about sort of UK comedy and what do you like about US comedy? And that's a quite I love question, their but... accents in the UK comedy. Yeah. It's so, it has so much character. You no, know, technically um, we don't have accents. This is how <laughs> things sound when they're pronounced properly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I am here basically to reinforce every stereotype of Americans. So really what I should tell you is that I don't, I have no idea. I, I, don't, I don't expose myself to anything that's not American, you know? Um, <laughs> Uh, the differences, uh, I think it's hard to a answer like in such broad terms, but... I, mean, I, I work a lot in, in the United States, not as much as I'd like. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, but it's a way I don't really see that there's a huge difference. I think there's more difference in, in sort, of, um, sort of social groupings within America, within Britain, than you see. Actually, when you go and play there, when you go and do shows, you notice that funny is funny, unless it's a very specific gag about something you, people can can play there and it just it works and equally when you go to the states and you know people are fans of tv shows the thing that i've really noticed recently globally is that people are watching the television they want to watch they're not making a decision about if comedy central don't put on broad city mm -hmm. in scandinavia they will find it they'll mm -hmm. find it online they'll bit torrent it they'll get it and they'll get the tv that they want that's the great sort of I suppose everyone is the equalizer. Is, yeah, is everyone's curating their own TV channel now globally? It feels, mm -hmm. and they're finding their stuff. So I play a lot in in South Africa, and weirdly, the show over there is QI. They all watch QI, but it's not on television. You, I mean, they only ever watch it illegally, but they all watch it. It's great. <laughs> it's great for the business. <laughs> well, it is. It is an odd thing. I mean, that thing of how do you how do you sort that out and the the, mm -hmm. the curse. But it's I suppose it makes you you know a fan of the show and you I don't know maybe you watch it more. Yeah, that that goes back to the tricky part. Yeah, mm -hmm. let's try and avoid the tricky part. Too tricky. Yeah. Any easy question? Oh, well, you had a question at the back there, the uh, Game of Thrones looking guy. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, uh, so a lot of my favourite comedies of the past few years have come from web series, so there's Broad City, then there's on HBO stuff like High Maintenance and Insecure. I was just wondering if, do you prefer to look at web series to develop into series on air, or do you prefer to do pilots? Uh, I think it's, it's, it's a new uh, sort of pipeline for development now. You know, the great, the positive side of the internet and technology is that uh, it puts, it puts uh, the resources in the hands of everyone. It's the most democratized form of communication ever. And there's, there's no gatekeepers anymore. So it doesn't prevent anyone from having their voice heard and, and seen. And I think the cream rises to the top. And so it's an easy way to get exposed to great talent and, and material. Um, I mean, you know, I think that the downside for that, as far as I can sort of see, is that the for, for lots of talent, I think you sort of, as a stand-up, you're on your own. You're on stage doing your thing and you're in charge of what you say and what you don't say. But TV is very much a collaborative medium. You work with other very creative people and I think we'd be forced to sort of think, oh, the creative people on TV, oh, you mean the ones in front of the camera? 
actually it's the creative producers and they need to make a living. They need to make, you know, and TV channels are the ones that fund that. So it has to be, sometimes, sometimes you know, a piece of talent doesn't really flower until they find the right partnership, the right, either it's a TV channel or it's producers or a company that they feel that oh, I can work with these people and they kind of have my vision. Whereas I think sort of being out there on your own, making stuff on the web can be incredibly difficult. So you could see stuff that isn't that great, but it's just because it, it isn't produced. It's not, it's, it's very raw. I, I answered the question for you, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I thought I'd just chip I in. just want to point out, I totally disagree with what Jimmy <laughs> just said. Um, no, I think that's true. Uh, but I do think that depending on where you're coming from, uh, that can be the route to finding the right creative partnerships, right? So maybe a producer. Someone sees you and... Right. And in some cases, uh, it actually forms in that. So, for example, we have a show called Corporate that's a scripted show that uh, launches at the beginning of next year. And it's three people who really created it. The three of them conceived it and write it. Two of them star in it. And the third one is their director. And the director is as talented as the other two. And that, you know, it, that's also very similar to Workaholics, which was our first, you know, we did eight seasons, I think, of Workaholics. That was our first one that, w that came from the web. And th th they were, there were four of them. And the fourth Beatle wa was Kyle, uh, who was the director, sometimes in the show as well. But, you know, the other three were the main actors. But they all wrote it together and, and produced it together. So I think in those cases, it's great that they had this collaborator who really brought a lot to the table, you know, in the form of directing and producing. But it really depends. But the short answer to your question is, it doesn't matter, it, both. You know, we're happy to be scouring every possibility, no matter how it presents itself to us. Any other, what else have we got? Oh yeah, there you go. Hi there. Um, you were speaking about Donald Trump earlier, and. I kind of get worried that we do so much of this stuff on Donald Trump that he becomes a caricature and we forget that actually he's possibly going to nuke career or he's cutting off the environment agency. So do you ever think about the responsibility with that and doing too much of just taking the mick out of him? Uh, yeah, I do. I think that it's easy to fall into this pattern where everyone is just, you know, it's the cliche of the echo chamber. Um, I, I don't think that the echo chamber is, I don't think that it's necessarily bad and that it empowers him in a way. I think that it maybe makes people a little bit desensitized when they're talking to themselves. But we also try, you know, I, t I mentioned earlier how there were so many shows came at us and we said no to every one of them except one. And the one we said yes to, we actually feel like is incredibly responsible because it's, it, Anthony's not just doing a caricature of Trump, he's doing a, a really deep psychological, I think, impersonation. And he's so wicked smart. And you know, you mentioned how he's a left-leaning liberal or whatever. Yeah. But he spent time working with Glenn Beck, and he really worked in the right wing of politics, not at, because that was his persuasion, but it was a job that he had. And he is so uh, conversant with policy and what's happening minute by minute. And that show's really responsive. So I think that he's doing a great job and, and his creative team are doing a great job of really being responsible where first and foremost it's funny, but the reason it's funny is because it's really tapping into not only what's happening, but what are the implications of it. So, and I would say the same for Trevor. You know, I think that, and, and Jim Jeffries, we have a, have a show with Jim Jeffries that was the one clip about Melania that was in there. I think they all have a different angle. Um, I think it's easy to look across the late night landscape and see that a lot of people are making the same jokes. But, you know, I have my biased opinion is that the shows that we have and the talent that we have are being incredibly responsible because they're making, they're, they're shi shining light on the implications as well as they're making fun with it. I think so. it's a very interesting thing as a comedian, sort of that idea of the responsibility of saying, you know, making jokes about this, you should be taking it very, very seriously. But I think they, I mean, for me, the real issue, and you know, I don't know if you agree, but I think the, the real issue is that The Daily Show now competes with Fox and CNN. The news has become entertainment, and the media haven't been responsible in their reporting, but that's the news media has become entertainment media and done incredibly well out of Trump. Um, that seems to be the bigger problem. I think the comedy shows are doing a brilliant job and they're informing people that are exhausted 
by this constant barrage of 24-7, the same story, and those voices giving it another angle, Jim Jeffries or, or Trevor Noah, that, like giving, giving it sort of an individual voice is actually making people wake up and I think what you'll see is people be much more sort of energised in the next election. There's younger people going out and saying, like, no, we need to stand for this. Yeah, I think, and I, that, that really started even before Trump and before Trevor. You know, for years and years, people talked about how Jon Stewart's Daily Show is where young people got their news from. Yeah. And John was always adamant about that we are not journalists, we're not a news show, we're a comedy show. And he, he held that position as long as he could. But at a certain point, that had become an institution that had credibility first and foremost. And I think as long as a show like that, the standard that they hold themselves up to is to really call bullshit on hypocrisy and deceit and all of those things, regardless of what form it's taking or where it's coming from, then you're on the right side of responsibility, I think. Sorry about North Korea. <laughs> <laughs> There's very little they can do, it turns out. Go on, you had a question. Yeah, I want to ask a question. Uh, yeah, have you ever gone too far? Have you ever, have you ever had legal problems with your is content? This, is this personal or business? Oh, <laughs> both. Because I know a little bit about this guy. <laughs> Tell us more. My, has he ever? <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me think. Have we ever gone too far? Well, South well Park, we, the Scientology South Park was a huge... Yeah, there were a couple with South Park. Uh, did it go too far? I don't know. No, there, I mean, I thought no was, one has died so far. As a, yeah. as a I mean, performer, not to be too fawning, but I do want to work with you, um, it does strike me that standing behind that talent and shoulder to shoulder and going, no, we 100% back this, is the key thing. That's why people want to work with you. I uh, appreciate that. But, and by the way, we don't say yes to everything. We do have a standards and practices department, and we have a legal department. So everything is vetted. I mean, we're pretty liberal about empowering can I people. Ask, can I ask, who, how do you get the job as the legal department on South Park? Because it feels like they've got their feet up. What's that? It feels like what? They have their feet up. It feels like that may be the easiest job. It's a pretty thing. good job, yeah. What have they said? Yeah, I don't matter. <laughs> I bet that'll be fine. Yeah. Well, you know, they, Matt and Trey have kind of earned their way to that, to having... I think they may be their own legal team. I think you may be yeah. fooled by a wig and a moustache. Yeah. <laughs> But I suppose that thing of like being willing to bring the lawyers in and say, no, we're going to back this, this is important. I mean, there was one with South Park where they were playing with the notion of Muhammad in a way that got very dicey. Uh, and ultimately, the network decided to put a black box so there was no depiction of Muhammad. And it was very, very tricky. Uh, and ultimately, you just try to find a balance of not putting censorship, but also we take it seriously that there, you know you don't want to put people's lives in danger either, right? So it's a, also a delicate balance. But for the most part, you know we try we just try to be responsible and and also not break the law. I mean, there's things that would be so fun and funny to put out there that would be illegal, and you know half the time we say no to that. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? Someone else had. Oh yeah, go on. where you have the most you know, supportive cities and states. Do you notice in middle America you have less, a smaller viewership? Um, yeah, it tends to go uh, more by the size of markets. So the bigger markets we tend to do better in. And there can be some uh, discrepancies between different shows and different talent who are more popular in one place or another. Like what? Like what? Uh, I would say that, like, for example, Daniel Tosh probably has more popularity in some places than, say, The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. Uh, you know, it's a different sensibility. You know, uh, traditionally our audience is really young guys, and uh, Tosh, his show has always been a bullseye to that market where The Daily Show skews a little bit older and a little bit more left coast, right, right coast. Um, can, I, can I sort of echo that question? But, but globally, do you notice where shows, have there been shows that haven't been that big in the States that have done incredibly well internationally? Um, well, part of, I think part of that is when, when they lend themselves, maybe even format, like we mentioned uh, Drunk History before, like that's really been sort of catching on as a format that can be produced locally where it's really about local history in a place. Um, and uh, 
you know, but even The Daily Show with Trevor, when John left The Daily Show, he was in, uh, I think, 72 markets internationally, and Trevor is like 130-something markets now, uh, give or take tens of markets. No, uh, you know... Not to take an interest in this job. What's that? Yeah. Um, but no, so uh, that's a really good example of where, you know, Trevor comes in with a global perspective and global appeal, and the show has really taken off internationally in a way that it didn't before. Is the show better? No, it's just, it's different, you know, and it's resonating in a different way. Sure. Cool. Sorry, sorry to ask another one. Just curious, have you ever been tempted, thanks, have you ever been tempted to try and establish uh, a daily show in the UK? Um, because we've never cracked well, late night talk. Who host such a thing? I'm <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> I can't think of anyone. Um, are you a producer by no, any chance? No, 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 no. Oh, well, okay. I mean, I'm He's quite just happy a guy to I found get on the, the street and gave <laughs> the bucks to. Because yeah. we've never cracked, we've never cracked it in the UK, and we've never cracked that late night talk show, stroke sort of daily review show. Have you ever been tempted to try something here? Um, I think part of that might also be budgetary. For, you know, and again, we're just in the process now of sort of merging our brains with our cohorts in, in, in the UK. Uh, so maybe stand by and we'll see what comes out of it. So I, I, can, I don't consider myself an expert on that market to say, oh, here's, here's how it could work. But my sense is that it's a little bit of a budgetary issue too. A show like The Daily Show uh, is expensive to produce. And uh, I don't know that it would make practical sense to just transfer that as it is into a UK show, for example. It might have to be reconceived in a way, but I, I think it definitely represents an opportunity. Well, I wonder, does that speak to the, the, you know, the late night question from earlier as to why late night hasn't worked off here? I think but that actually should be the, part of it. The budget is so huge mm -hmm. on a late night show. And we, you know, we often just get you know, clips of you know, Letterman or, or James Corden, but the the amount of work that goes into those shows, the amount of writers, the amount mm -hmm. of production that's there, it's phenomenal. And often here, it's like people aren't willing to put in that, that you know, that, mm -hmm. that's a big bet to make. And it's a different marketplace, you know. And maybe that's part of why uh, the panel shows have done well. They're, they're, they're much cheaper to produce. And, uh, but also you have so many witty, smart, funny comedians. We do. We do those, yeah. We do. Yeah. God, love them. Um, well, well, we'll wrap things up in a minute. Any, any final questions? Would anyone like a, a commission from... No, uh, go on. Um, in America, you do pretty well in terms of diversity, and, um, you know, you've got some really great uh, shows led by um, uh, female comedians, comedians who are female. Um, is that something you have to work really hard at, or do you find that because you kind of demonstrate that, that it almost welcomes a diverse spectrum of talent coming to you? Um, can we just talk about... Okay, sure. Yeah, I understood a third of what you just said. Um, but what I gleaned out of that was about female comedy, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. but also uh, that's actually a great question. Well. Because when I came to Comedy Central, there, there really wasn't much in the way of female-driven comedy. And, there was, and I referenced a moment ago about how our, our core audience is young guys, and I think there was a conventional wisdom about uh, that we have to, everything has to be male driven for our young male audience. And I, I really pushed against that because I feel like funny is funny regardless of gender or color or anything else. Uh, and so yeah, there was some conventional wisdom that was there as resistance in a way. Uh, and um, so what, Amy Schumer was the first one. The, the, and the Nikki way- Laser. Last year, yeah. Yep. Brilliant. There's been several. It really started with uh, with Amy Schumer and continued with Broad City, and then we've done several since. Um, and we don't really think of it as like, oh, this is now we've kind of gone beyond that, where we're thinking, is this male, female, black, Hispanic, whatever. Um, but the way we approached it at the beginning was. It's not that we are now, we didn't want to treat it as almost like a pandering. Oh, let's go for a female audience and let's get a female comic to do a show. It was really more about like, Amy Schumer is so goddamn funny and has so much to say. And it feels like it would be appealing to our young guy audience, but might also have the opportunity to expand an audience and bring more women in. That was sort of the way we approached it. 
you know, Broad City felt like the perfect companion to workaholics at that time. And it seemed like a no-brainer. They were, they were so funny and had such a smart point of view. And it just seemed like a scripted show that would pair really well with, with workaholics. So it was sort of that kind of context that we started building that way. To wrap up then, it seems that something that you said earlier, I never had a plan. Uh, early on, which seems remarkable. I mean, it's an incredibly successful career in television, but it does seem that you're very open to people just coming along and saying, well, this here's an idea for a thing. Oh, okay, we'll do that. That's why we may do The Daily Show with Jimmy Carr in the UK soon, sure. starting next week. <laughs> just have to sign this. Uh, on that brilliant note. Isn't that weird that he brought a piece of paper with words on it and a pen? <laughs> it does seem odd, it do now thinking about it. I like your preparation. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, Oh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Kent Altman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good fun.